you and I were in Chicago together. I was there to talk to Richard Dawkins on stage, um, which has been partially but not entirely captured on video. So I wish the whole thing had been captured. But anyway, there's a big chunk of it. People can go check it out if they want. But um, in any case, the morning before my meeting with Dawkins on stage, you and I had breakfast with Jerry Coyne. And I asked Jerry Coyne a question that I then went on to ask Richard Dawkins on stage. Jerry Coyne and Richard Dawkins were not talking at that point. So I know that the fact that they both gave me the same answer was not the result. It's not a single data point. It's two data points. And the data point was so ridiculous that um, it struck me as like a symptom of a, a disease. I asked them why there had been no substantial progress, theoretically. What was the last major breakthrough in evolutionary biology? Now, there have been breakthroughs in um, the hybrid discipline, uh, evolution of development, Evo Devo, um, that have largely resulted from the fact that we can now peer more deeply into developmental biology than we could 30, 40 years ago, and that has kicked loose a bunch of progress uh, uh, that is at the interface between um, mechanism and phenomenology. But as far as I can tell, the last major development in evolutionary biology in the traditional sense was 1976. Ironically enough, uh, it's Dawkins who, in his what I would call synthetic work, um, The Selfish Gene, makes a couple of kinds of um, significant breakthroughs, but he seems to misunderstand them. So in any case, if we take as an assumption, and neither of these guys challenged my argument that there hadn't been a major breakthrough since 76, they both seem to accept that. Um, when I asked them why there hadn't been a major breakthrough, they both told me that it was because their generation had solved all of the big puzzles and had been basically left uh, a cleanup operation that didn't result in uh, people making themselves famous in the way that Dawkins has become famous, um, that basically the, the field was, a, uh, was solved. Now, I know, because I once believed that that was true when I was a college student, and later came to understand that actually what had really happened was we had stopped talking about all of the big questions that that evolutionary biology had not yet answered all of the paradoxes it left on the table, uh, including big things like um, where did all the species come from? Um, why do females put males in so many species to challenges that then cause them to burden their male offspring with elaborate displays that are not uh, helpful? Things like that. So I knew that there were lots of challenges that had not been addressed by that generation, but these two guys, um, leading lights of that generation, seemed to think it was solved. And my point now, if I can return to the present, is that that belief that the field had reached a level of sophistication that effectively it was finished um, is the sound of scientists claiming that science is settled and when scientists do this, when they take stuff off the table with respect to it being challengeable, they then create an increasing pattern of fragility. So my claim is going to be that the when I was in when you and I were in college and graduate school, intelligent design is not something we gave almost a second thought to ever. It was too preposterous. Um, when I encountered people like Stephen Myers, who were not phony scientists, right, pretending to do the work, they were actually very good at what they did. And I believe Stephen Myers is motivated by a religious motivation, but we don't generally ask the question when somebody takes up science, you know, what are you really in it for? Are you in it for the fame? We don't, that's not a legitimate challenge to somebody's work. And the fact is, Stephen Myers is very good at what he does. He may be motivated by the thought that at the end of the, uh, the search, he's going to find Jesus. But in terms of the quality of his arguments, and I was very impressed when I met him, his love for biology his love for creatures, the weirder, the better. He likes them, mm -hmm. right? So that looked very familiar to me. And it also 
became obvious to me in interacting with Stephen Myers and uh, many of his high quality colleagues that they're actually motivated for whatever reason to do the job that we are supposed to be motivated to do inside of biology. They're looking for cracks in the, the theory, things that we haven't yet explained, and they're looking for those things for their own reasons. But the point is we're supposed to be figuring out what parts of, what, of the stories we tell ourselves aren't true because that's how we get smarter over time. Science is supposed, all scientists are supposed to provide their own loyal opposition at some level. And scientific fields, increasingly, you are arguing, have abandoned that. And so just as it's useful for liberals to have conservatives around on, on college campuses, it makes them smarter and their absence is making them dumber, uh, that the field of evolutionary biology, absent real critique, is allowing it to stagnate. 100%. And I know I have my own motivations. Maybe I'm not fully aware of them. Maybe I am. But I know that as a, an honorable scientist, I am motivated to find things about Darwinism where the story is wrong. Right. And my belief is that what will come out of that is more and better Darwinism, right? I don't see any reason to doubt Darwinism. In fact, I'm going to make an argument that that's preposterous in its own right. Um, but am I going to avoid those questions? No, I'm going to, anytime you raise a real question where we haven't got it answered, my feeling is, hey, there's something to do. That sounds like fun, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's 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 why I became what I, in my own mind, think of as um, a big game hunter. It sounds like fun, presumably unless you have grants hinging on a different outcome, or you have an entire career behind you hinging on a different outcome. Yes, or yeah, you've written books that um, are, you know, your legacy and you realize that things in them aren't quite right or you don't allow yourself to realize that because the illusion is too important to you that you did better than you did. And mind you, I am not, I will take coin to task and I will take coin to task for a reason. I am not taking Dawkins to task for what he accomplished. Mm -hmm. What he accomplished was profound and important and it was a stage in the process. I'm angry at him for embracing it as if it was a more complete answer than it was and for failing to recognize the parts of it that are wrong. But I think he did, you know, in 1976, he did very, very well. And so anyway, I think that's great. And he made his contribution. And I think he's kind of wrecking it now by, you know, what these guys did was they failed to mint their own replacements. And what an honorable science scientist does, what our mentors did, was they produced people who they knew would exceed them if they did their job correctly. That's the very nature of this job, is that you create your own replacements and hopefully, you know, I mean, and in fact, we used to talk in graduate school when we thought about, you know, that process of mentoring and, and uh, apprenticing and all of that. Um, we used to recognize that there were two jobs and oftentimes there was a trade-off between mentors who were really good at producing scientific, high quality scientific thinkers and mentors who were really good at nailing the, uh, the processes that were being described. And sometimes people would, you know, who were thinking about going to graduate school, they'd be very excited about somebody's work. Should I go work with that person? And we would say, look, you should talk to that person's graduate students and find out whether they're good at the other job, because if they're not good at mentoring, then the fact that they're very good at thinking is maybe not so useful to you, mm -hmm. right? You should find somebody who's good at, at producing their own replacement. And so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed at that generation for not producing their own replacements properly and for lying to themselves about why they didn't. That next generation wasn't necessary because they had done so well. And that sounds like a lot of bullshit to me. And it sounded like a lot of bullshit to me when uh, both Dawkins and Coyne offered that as a uh, as some sort of an explanation for a phenomenon that isn't even true, that all the big questions were answered, which they obviously aren't. Um, so... Anyway, back to the puzzle. If you decide that Darwinism is more complete as a body of work than it is, and you decide that your challengers aren't entitled to a hearing because they're motivated by the wrong stuff, 
then you do two things. One, you artificially stunt the growth of your field and you create a more vibrant realm where your competitors have a better field to play in because you've left a lot of um, holes in the theory ready to be identified, which I think is what's going on. The better intelligent design folks are finding real questions raised by Darwinism, and the Darwinists um, are, instead of answering those questions, they're deciding it's not worthy of their time. And that is, uh, it is putting us on a collision course. So I'm not familiar with um, most of the arguments that are coming out of the new intelligent design movement. Um, <clears throat> it hasn't felt like it was my obligation to be familiar with them. Uh, perhaps what you're arguing is it is our responsibility. Um, but the main thing that I see in just the, uh, the Glertner review of the Myers book that was pointed to in that Twitter thread that's published in the Claremont Review of Books in 2019 um, is an argument, uh, a, well, there, there's a molecular argument, but with regard to the fossil record, the fossil record is incomplete and, uh, and that the whole thing is statistically very unlikely. Um, which do sound like arguments that, of course, in evolution of biology, we hear all the time. Um, and I guess I wonder, you know, paleontology and what we sometimes call in biology neontology, you know, the people who study extant forms as opposed to extinct forms, uh, do inherently operate by different means and with different methods because uh, historical science uh, is inherently one-off and does not exactly repeat itself, just like history does not exactly repeat itself. Uh, and so the because the methods and means aren't exactly the same um, and paleontology is not what I was doing, not what you were doing, I can't speak directly to it, but um, the, the holiness, the gaps in the fossil record Better. <laughs> um, have never... I, I, I don't know how to make the counter argument because the argument seems to be this is improbable and um and i think evolutionary biologists aren't claiming that it's not improbable it's just there's a lot a lot a lot of time involved um no let's let's divide some arguments up first of all the improbability argument i believe is more at the molecular level okay okay so the, the point is okay so it's the gaps in the fossil record and the improbability of um, you know, 150 string uh, sequences, each of which could be, or three, uh, yeah, the, the math can go a lot of different ways, but um, very, lots and lots of possibilities with only a few possibilities that are actually functional. Uh, what are the, what are the chances that you end up with functional? Right. So the, the, you got these two arguments. You've got a functional protein is so far from a soup of amino acids that it's very improbable that selection can even bootstrap something new that's useful enough for the process of Darwinism to take over. Um, that's one thing. Then there's this Cambrian explosion thing, which stands in for the gappiness of the fossil record. It's sort of the ultimate case of a gap that's inexplicable, seemingly. Um, and it has the utility of Darwin worried about it himself. Um, so it's like, oh, this is something Darwin figured was going to be filled in by future work, and we're still kind of scratching our heads over it. Now, Here's the reason that I think it is important to take this sort of stuff seriously. And let me go back to one thing. In my opinion, I am basically on the team of anybody who is forthrightly looking for elements of our evolutionary theory that are not uh, complete, looking for th paradoxes, right? That's the team. And that team should include people who expect Darwinism to meet the challenge and those who expect it not to. Um, the reason that something like the Cambrian explosion and its failure to be answered by standard Darwinism is important is that, in my opinion, it does point directly to an, an, the most important element of Darwinism, which has yet to be discovered, which is something that I call explorer modes, something that, interestingly, Dawkins has mocked me for. And so, okay, now you've got a, an interesting question, which is, am I going to turn out to be right? that we are looking at Darwinism 10.0 and that Darwinism has figured out ways to enhance the capacity of Darwinian processes, right? Which I feel is a slam dunk, but I'm, oh, I'm open to that battle. And I expect that if we pursue that question, what we're going to find is, oh, there's a layer of Darwinism we didn't get. 
And it's going to turn out that the intelligent design folks are going to be wrong, but they will have played a very noble and important role in the process of us getting smarter. Yeah. Um, and look, I think Stephen Myers, at the end of the day, I don't think he's going to surrender to the idea that there's no God at the end of this process. But if we find a layer of Darwinism that hasn't been spotted that answers his question, I think he's going to be delighted with it the same way he's delighted by the prospect of seeing whale sharks. Right. So anyway, that's all how the process is supposed to work. What it's not supposed to work is we're supposed to say Darwinism is settled science. The Cambrian explosion is not a question, yada, yada, yada. So you've got, but every time we find one of these things that's legitimate, it's going to point to something that will be very worth its while for us to discover. And anytime we shut down the question, unless the question really isn't a question, we're going to hobble our own capacity to see further and understand better. So um, Cambrian explosion and the gappiness of the fossil record, I don't believe that's going to turn out to be a major challenge. I believe that's going to be a combination of phenomena that we already do know about. And you're going to be able to see why you would expect the fossil record to look like that, even if Darwin is right as understood. Um, the improbability of proteins question, I believe you're going to have another layer that there's going to be a mechanism by which... Kind of like a heuristic mechanism. Right. Just, just like in trying to decipher the most parsimonious evolutionary tree from a character set where you can't expect the computer to search through every single possibility because there is not enough time in the universe. But uh, it starts... Uh, being constrained, constraining itself based on things that seem most likely. And might it miss something real? Maybe. Um, but a, a heuristic layer somewhere in the mutation space. Precisely. And I believe this was implied, and I said so at the time. I can't remember whether it was Twitter or uh, we discussed it, but there was a surprise breakthrough in the prediction of protein folding that was mm -hmm. done by a computer algorithm. And what I said at the time was that it implies an evolutionary heuristic that makes mm. that a far more tractable problem than we understood. Yeah. So it's exactly that. Every time you look at one of these things that causes the people who doubt Darwinism to get excited, you're actually looking at an opportunity to upgrade Darwinism. And here's a place to, I mean, just, just like I just did, where we can look and see what, what computers have done and imagine that probably evolution could have done it as well. Right. And that done, you know, just the same way yeah, a lot of right. chemical reactions are it's reversible. Analogous. The point is you, you find a way that the problem is more tractable intellectually than you think. It may be biologically more tractable than you think, too. Right. Uh -huh. That those two things are mirrors of each other. Right. And, you know, as as Dawkins himself has famously said, failure of imagination is not an argument. Is not an argument. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs>